All right, why don't we get started? Thank you everyone for joining. It's morning over here on the west coast of the US, but depending on where you're from, it could be good evening, it could be good, good afternoon. <laughs> Um, I'm going to basically be going through um, our mobile application gateway, which is a description of the solution that supports mobile application development. We as, at SOS Software are basically an, an API management company. So what the mobile application gateway does is it essentially helps you as an organization to expose APIs specifically to support mobile application development. When you think about APIs, I'm not sure how many uh, of the people on the line are very familiar with APIs, but if you look at what APIs are being used for today, it's to support a multitude of different applications, devices, and things in the internet today. If you think about your company and how it's going to be supporting a variety of different channels or devices, if you think about uh, exposing functionality within your business to support tablet-based applications, web applications, gaming consoles, mobile devices, smartphones, vehicles, connected appliances, websites, a variety of different enterprise applications, and ultimately B2B transactions, you're looking at building an API or a set of APIs to support these various digital channels. So an API grows and starts becoming a very, very valuable channel in its own right to your business. And what we're seeing is that customers are building APIs and they're promoting APIs and they're productizing APIs as a digital channel in its own right. So they are trying to encourage developers and partners to build their own applications and maintaining a technical arm's length relationship with that developer and that partner. And what I mean by that is they're going out and they're publishing an API, and they're essentially building it and hoping that people come. And that involves a lot of productization, a lot of marketing, a lot of promotion, and basically a lot of integration into back-end systems and services that you have within your organization. The API, I like to say, is sort of becoming the website of this decade. If you think back to the 90s, everyone was trying to figure out how they were going to expose a website and how they were going to leverage the web and the internet in general as a new channel for their business. Now when I talk to people, they're trying to figure out how they're going to expose APIs and how they're going to leverage APIs as a digital channel to support a variety of different mobile applications and other web applications and partner-based applications. Basically, how are they going to expose an API as a channel, as a product, as a way for the business to make money? So when you look at a company and when you look at how exactly that API can be exposed, you basically have a set of back-end systems that you need to piece together to expose an API. And you want to be able to do that as quickly as possible and, of course, as securely as possible. When you look at the, the, the speed at which technology is evolving and you're looking at exploiting mobile channels and the Internet of Things as a whole, you really are getting into a, a, a technology race, essentially. You want to be able to expose these new business channels and you want to handle new applications at a high rate and you want to support the adoption of those applications at as high a rate as possible. If you think about how many new mobile applications are being built and delivered and how quickly they're being adopted, and the very next day, how quickly they fall out of fashion, and the next one gets picked up and adopted, you realize that building an application in itself is not necessarily a long-term solution. Building an API that can be picked up and used by the application developers as they rise to fame and as they fall from grace is a very, very good idea for the business. So you really need to be able to support a certain amount of velocity around application development. And that means that you need to be able to support a certain amount of velocity around the development and support and maintenance and change around an API. So when you look at the set of capabilities that you need to provide, they're all geared towards how can you actually deliver this API quickly, safely, securely, and in a way that is consumable by the app developer, in this case, the mobile app developer. So I like to break down the set of capabilities that you need as an organization or 
that, that you need from a mobile application gateway into these six bullets. You need the ability to mediate, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. You need the ability to orchestrate. You need an integration capability. You need a user experience for that API, and I'll talk about that as well. You need to provide quality of service and security around that API. And then last but not least, you need to be able to manage the life cycle, the change management, the impact analysis around how you're going to actually manage subsequent versions of that API. A lot of people can get their first API out the door, but large enterprises, which I deal with on a daily basis, are concerned about how they're going to manage a whole portfolio of APIs and how they're going to manage dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of applications using these APIs and changing or versioning that API at the end of the day. So let me go through each of these points in turn. The first one is about mediation. And again, there's going to be a common theme as I go through this around speed and simplicity. Mediation is all about lowering costs and improving your time to market. So how can you get an API out as quickly as possible? And this is all around leveraging what you already have within the enterprise. People have spent a great deal of time and a great deal of money creating a service-oriented architecture behind the firewall. They have componentized their applications. They've exposed standard-based interfaces internally for application-to-application -application integration. And now what they want to do is they want to expose an API to the outside world. And in most cases, you're dealing with three different kinds of mediations. You're dealing with message-based mediations. And as I mentioned, internally, people have used XML for a, a long time, and they need to expose that uh, XML service to the outside world as an API. But now you have a problem, right? Internally, you may be using SOAP, but externally, you want to expose a, a RESTful uh, beautiful looking API that leverages JSON that's easily consumable by a mobile application. So you need to be able to mediate between JSON and a RESTful style of message invocation and uh, a tr more traditional SOAP-based service. SOAP and XML is great for application to application because it's very well defined, you can manage the versions, but it's just not that consumable by a mobile device and it's also not very human readable. And those are the two things that you're trying to overcome when you're exposing an API, again, because you're trying to speed up the pace of development. So while you might have SOAP and XML internally, you want to expose that API to the outside world using maybe JSON and, and REST, or maybe WebSockets, or maybe another protocol that's coming down the line. Next year, you don't even know what kind of standards and protocols you may want to support to, to, to allow your app developers to use the latest in technologies and the latest in devices. So you need a layer that's going to provide you with mediation and help you stay abreast of those changes in, uh, in, in, in the mobile app development environment. So you have message mediations. How do I convert from a traditional SOAP XML kind of message that's used internally and something external that is uh, potentially uh, consumable by a mobile application? The second mediation is around security. How can I expose uh, something that is consumable by a mobile application? Maybe it's OAuth2-legged, uh, uh, an OAuth2-legged security mechanism. But internally, I'm using SAML. So how do I mediate? How do I exchange a SAML token, effectively, uh, or an OAuth token for a SAML token? How do I cross those boundaries, those security boundaries? How do I impersonate? How do I mediate between different security standards? And the reason that you want to do this, again, is to, to get that API out there quickly. You want to be able to live within the constraints that you have internally around the security mechanisms that you have, but then simply and quickly layer on top of that something that is consumable and usable by a mobile application. And then last but not least, of course, you have transport-based security. I mean, internally, I run into all sorts of different kinds of uh, transports and uh, communication mechanisms, JMS, for example, or NetTCP if you're a Microsoft shop, and you typically want to expose those using HTTP or maybe WebSockets. So you need a mediation layer that's going to maybe pick up a message off a JMS queue and send it back to the device somehow. 
Maybe it's a notification. Maybe it's a web sockets call. Maybe you're going to be polling through HTTP. You need to convert between sync and async and, and messaging protocols and HTTP protocols and ensure reliability potentially uh, between these different transaction types. So mediation is a very, very important bucket of things, and it also provides you with that layer that you need to, to decouple your mobile development experience from anything that's happening internally. Standards are going to be changing. Uh, your backends are going to be changing. You want to isolate your developers potentially from those things. The next point or the next valuable um, uh, feature of a mobile application gateway is orchestration. And orchestration is needed primarily to simplify development. And once again, this is a speed, a time to market thing. You need to be able to create APIs and or services from backend systems with as little coding as possible. Typically, when we're talking to people uh, about exposing APIs, they're trying to meet, meet a specific business need or a specific marketing program or some demands from some digital channel. And they need to be able to take existing services that already exist within the enterprise and expose those as APIs. And they want to be able to reuse those common capabilities and processes. So, for example, if you've written something, a, a process that converts something to something else or makes a call out or does some enrichment or, or does some basic orchestration, you need to be able to reuse that for subsequent versions of your API without having to recode everything. So you need some kind of declarative, visual, drag and drop orchestration tool that really allows you to quickly create APIs and services from whatever backend systems that you have with a minimum amount of coding. The reason for this, I think probably the biggest reason for this, is to, so that you do. Okay, so um, orchestration is all around simplifying the development uh, of these APIs. And the biggest reason I, I, I see for this is basically decoupling the release lifecycle of your API from the release lifecycle of your backend apps. Because you're always going to have potentially a lot of backend systems, and within a large organization, these are not necessarily owned by the same people who own the API. So you don't necessarily want to be beholden. Uh, to the backend, uh, you know, the backend systems developers and their long-running SDLC processes, or their own commitments, or their project timelines, or whatever they have, you want to provide yourself with at least some flexibility so that you can expose your API, you can transform things, you can orchestrate things, and 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 hopefully decouple your API release uh, lifecycle from any sort of backend, and that flows both ways as well. You know the. If you expose an API and you have a mobile application that's really popular that's using that API, you can't just change that at a whim. You need to abstract yourself or isolate the API, keep that interface consistent and well-disciplined, and uh, not have it subject to any kinds of changes on the back end. So you might have to dance around a little bit you know, to keep that API consistent, and that can be provided uh, with, a, with an orchestration engine. And hopefully that lowers the, uh, the, 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 the time it takes to write custom code and the skills required to custom code as well as the infrastructure required to write custom code. So what we're trying to do here is just limit the amount of development that occurs to get that API out quickly. All right. The third point is, is integration. And integration is all around providing you with flexibility and agility. The key thing around integration or, or the scripting capabilities that you need to provide in a mobile application gateway is really to do rapid prototyping and sandbox development. So if I go and um, I, 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 I'm releasing API version 2, and people are going to start writing applications or mobile apps against API version 2, then I need some kind of stubbed out version of that API that people can start hitting against and testing their applications against. You can release a sandbox version of an API by basically scripting the request and response behaviors for that API before you've even built it. So you can start building your mobile application. You can decouple the mobile application development from the API development by essentially scripting the actual uh, API stubs themselves. And this scripting can, can, can basically uh, take on multiple forms. Of course, we tend to prefer JavaScript, especially for JSON, but you can use Beanshell and, and, and Jython and other scripting languages as well within 
um, the mobile application gateway. So that allows you to, to rapidly prototype APIs. Uh, you can even get feedback on an API before you've started building it and see what people think about it and see if it's usable and provide sandbox endpoints uh, even you know, uh, for, for, for a long running period of time. The other thing that scripting gives you is a lot of flexibility. Maybe things that you can't do through orchestration or you can't do through a standard transformation, you can then do through scripting. So transformation or enrichment of an API is very, very valuable if you have those scripting and customization capabilities that fall under this integration uh, banner. The next point I want to discuss is around experience. And when, you, when you're using a mobile application, yes, you have to build a beautiful API, and the, the API basically has to be representative of the user experience. It needs to be human readable. It needs to, excuse me, it needs to support that user experience. But there are certain very pragmatic things that come to, 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 to the surface. Mobile application is basically globally distributed. It, typically cannot benefit or, or can't benefit very easily from traditional CDN and, and acceleration technologies. And this is primarily because of edge security. The edge security mechanisms that you have around APIs are not typically supported, at least not today, by CDN vendors and acceleration vendors. So to improve performance, you need a way of providing caching that's closer to the app. So you need to provide a, a network essentially of mobile application gateways, a global network of mobile application gateways to basically deliver the content or deliver the APIs as close to the mobile application as possible. You also need to be able to support things like paging. So if you have uh, potentially a large collection of objects in a JSON message that's, that's coming from the back end, the back end might not necessarily support paging. So somewhere in the middle there, you're going to have to provide a way for the mobile device to be able to page through search results, collections of lawnmowers, whatever the case might be, you know, you're going to have to provide that layer that manages user experience ultimately for that mobile application. So caching uh, near, close to the edge, caching close to the, the mobile application, security close to the mobile application, and paging as a, as a layer between the API uh, and the backend systems. These are very, very important things that you need to basically support a good and, and fast mobile experience. And this comes back to how quickly can you get that app adopted, which fundamentally affects the API design at the end of the day. The next point is around security and quality of service. Um, you can go and build security and quality of service measures into your backend application. You can, you can sit there and you can write a whole bunch of code and you can figure out how you're going to do security, get some open source libraries, write some interesting stream uh, decorators that do quality of service management to for your, your API. Press star six but essentially, or six. that's not your business. Your business is selling lawnmowers. And you really need to focus on exposing an API that, that sells as many lawnmowers as possible. So what I would encourage everyone to do, partly selfishly, is to go out and figure out how you can do security and quality of service, or how can you get a mobile application gateway to provide you with a security and quality of service capability on top of the API that you're designing and building. And this will basically lower your risk and, and speed up your development. You don't have to figure out security because somebody else has. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't come into your, your life cycle and version management and your development times of your API either. So every single iteration of your API is shorter because security and quality of service and licensing and all of those kinds of things have been separated out. All of those non-functional requirements have been separated out from the API implementation. And this includes a number of different things. As I mentioned, security. So if you think about OAuth, that certainly provides you with um, uh, authorization. You might also have OpenID or a variety of different authentication mechanisms. But then there's going to be things like entitlements. So how many lawnmowers can somebody buy? Or how many API calls for a particular piece of content can somebody uh, make within the course of a month? So you need to figure out how you're going to monetize your API, what are the different 
tiers of service that you're going to have, and you need to find some way of supporting that go-to-market or business model uh, within your infrastructure. And it's a lot, lot easier to buy, or a lot, lot quicker to buy a, a mobile application gateway that can provide you with the security, the entitlements, the license management, the monetization, the reporting, then try and build that yourself. These things are non-functional requirements that you should not have to build and should not really get in the way of your business. At the end of the day, you're trying to expose something that is a new channel for your business, and it's it's going to be awkward when you go to the business manager and say, well, yeah, we don't have our API launched yet because I haven't figured out how I'm going to do OAuth and entitlement. They're not going to care, right? All they want to do is sell lawnmowers, and you need to get to that point as quickly as possible. The other classic non-functional requirement, of course, which I mentioned in the previous slide, is also around caching. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do caching uh, and paging, of course. Uh, you might do it in conjunction with a CDN. You might do caching differently for... For, for, for gets, of course, compared to posts and, and, and deletes and things like that. But there's also other protocols which affect caching in different ways. So how do you do caching if your back end is a JMS queue and, you're, and you want to do web sockets? Well, what does caching mean in that context? People have figured this out, and customers have implemented solutions that already work in, in a production environment. So don't get bogged down in non-functional requirements get yourself a mobile application gateway. The next point is all around lifecycle management. And, and this, is a, you know, this is a topic I, I, I discuss a lot with our customers because when you go out and build your first API, you don't care about lifecycle management, right? You, you, you're building an API, you, you're singularly focused, you understand exactly, hopefully, you understand exactly what you're trying to accomplish. But the real problem comes in, especially with large companies, and, and I hope some of you are on the line, is how do you actually, you know, if you have more than one API that, and, and you have APIs that are not necessarily the focus of your business, APIs to you is just another channel. So how do you build the right API? How do you, how do you scale that? You know, you might have one person there that really knows everything there is to know about building a beautiful API, but that doesn't scale well. How do you get all of your development teams to build good APIs? You know, you might be using APIs to support a large number of different apps. How can you as an architect make sure, if, if you want, that, that, that all your APIs conform beautifully to, to HTS best practices? You know, it's very, very difficult to do, and it's, it, it's going to get out of hand, especially after the first version's been released and you now want to release version 2 that thing's going to start looking like a Rube Goldberg machine. It's, it's, going to, it's going to warp. It's going to start getting ugly. It's going to start di uh, diverging from what you imagine as a good and beautiful and simple API. The, the basic facts of life are going to start interfering with it. So when you look at your API and your API program, think about how you're going to do lifecycle management. Think about how you're going to control your SDLC. Think about how you're going to manage that development lifecycle of that API and then not only that, but how are you going to manage the development lifecycle of the app, the packaging of the apps, the publication of the apps into maybe an enterprise app store, or maybe the certification to of apps your line, using your app. There's or a lot of lifecycle um, uh, uh, concerns that you need to take care of when you're building an API. If you think about it, you build an API, but associated with the API is the documentation, the legal agreements, the sandbox, the stubs. All of these things take time to develop and involve multiple work streams. So at the end of the day, you are going to have to, at very least, put pen to paper and figure out what your API SDLC is going to look like and how it relates to the other development life cycles within your organization. What we do is we provide a product that actually codifies that SDLC process, all of the workflows associated with it, the templates that you provide to your developers, the best practices that you, divide to, that you provide to your developers, and all of that's packaged up uh, into a capability uh, that is generically lifecycle management, life management. So just to delve into that a little bit, if you think about your API development lifecycle, you're trying to prevent failure. So you're, you're trying to help people build APIs, and you're trying to get them to build them the right way the first time. So how do you do dependency modeling? How do you automate the workflow process? How do you do li a license management? 
how do you manage templates for documentation as well as potentially code samples? How do you ensure interoperability with different mobile devices? And how do you manage the validation uh, of both the APIs, the metadata, the documentation, the licenses, and all of those things associated with that? And then last but not least, how do you actually publish that API, its metadata, its documentation into a developer portal? What is actually that process to get it in there? Um, if you look at the diagram on the right, I talk about capture, approval, definition, and publication. And these are basic steps in the life cycle of, of an API that might take place over the course of six months and for every version and in, with parallel work streams. So if, you, if you're an enterprise and you're looking at publishing APIs for mobile devices or B2B or, whatever, or, or what have you, you're going to have multiple development streams that are running over a longer period of time, and you are going to run out of singular geniuses that can manage your API soup to nuts. You are going to have to provide a framework, a process, that normal people can operate in to build an API. The next uh, example lifecycle is about app pa packaging and publication. We see this a lot. You know, apps have to be approved or certified, and there's a, you know, there's a sandbox and a set of tests that an application might have to go through. If you think about an application that is a peer payments application that is using a bank's API, well, a bank is, is not going to allow just everybody to, to release an app based on that API. They're going to potentially want some level of certification. Certainly, a lot of legal documentation and sign-offs, maybe it's PCI-related, if, you, if you're looking for a, a long-running, hair-pulling-out, going-gray process, that's PCI. So uh, there's a lot of other constraints, whether they be legal or process or, or just around business, that you need to go through potentially before an application can be published into an app store. Whether it be public or internal, it doesn't really matter. So there's a process of approval. There's a process of, of building an application, of packaging that application, providing the documentation, and lastly, publishing it into an app store. And these are just examples of the kinds of life cycles that you might need to have to consider when you are launching an API program, especially past your first API or the first version of your API. So that's enough about the capabilities. So what we do is, as, as, as SOA Software, is we provide a solution that we call the Mobile Application Gateway. And the mobile application gateway essentially provides all of these capabilities. We, we do mediation between the, the external and the internal facing. Scripting to allow you to do rapid prototyping and provide sandbox and do custom things within the gateway. We help enhance the mobile app, app experience either by caching or uh, security or paging um, or simply a stateful layer that performs transformations and orchestration in the middle. We provide orchestration, so you can quickly get those APIs up and running without being beholden to your back-end uh, API or, or your back-end systems developers. You can quickly release that API, you can make that API look the way you want it to look, and you can quickly customize it and change it. It gives you that agility to meet what is essentially a very, very agile digital channel. Security. We provide OAuth and, and OpenID and HMAC-based security and entitlements and authentication and authorization and SAML and WS Trust and a whole host of different kinds of security capabilities, both to facilitate the mediation uh, between external facing credentials and internal facing credentials, as well as simply just providing that security layer, that, that those non-functional requirements on top of your API, freeing you up to actually build a good API in the first place. And then last but not least, the life cycle. So how do you actually manage the publication or, or the, the, the production of an API? And how do you manage the production or the certification or the approvals of an application that's using that API? The mobile application gateway is uh, available both on-premise, so you can install it on-premise. And it comes actually in two forms on-premise. It either comes as a virtual appliance so you can download and install a virtual appliance, and this is typically for people who want to get up and running quickly. Or you can install it as a software product, um, or uh, you can actually use it in the cloud. So we have a multi-tenant global infrastructure 
that can provide a lot of capabilities like global caching uh, and global security for your mobile apps and ultimately help you launch or, or push that mobile API into, uh, a, a, into something that is more globally accessible. So we can provide the acceleration, the caching, the, the security as close to the mobile application endpoint as we can get. And you can leverage those capabilities we have and, the, and reap the benefits of our cloud um, at a very, very convenient price point and certainly very, very quickly. So the opportunity of, of a platform as a service kind of offering is that you can get up and running really, really quickly. You can take your API and effectively launch it globally um, and publish it globally uh, very, very quickly and easily. The third diagram or the third little block talks about a hybrid model. You might want to uh, also have a mobile application gateway on premise. For example, if you're doing orchestration, sometimes it doesn't make sense to, to leverage it purely in the cloud because orchestration can sometimes be quite chatty. So you might have to do some orchestration on premise. So you might leverage both our cloud offering and our on-premise offering where our on-premise offering is doing mediation with the security mechanisms you have internally and is doing some uh, orchestration that is, that is fairly chatty and, and, and you don't want to incur the, the, the cost of speed of light for multiple calls. And that exposes the API. And then the cloud will take, our cloud offering will take that API endpoint and essentially provide the non-functional caching and security and things like that that is closer to the mobile application itself. So the mobile application gateway is essentially available on-premise, in the cloud, as a virtual appliance. It's a solution that essentially helps your organization lower cost and improve your time to market. It helps you simplify development. It provides you with the flexibility and agility that you need to get your job done. It improves the user experience for mobile applications, lowers risk and speeds up development by basically removing the burden of those non-functional requirements, and it prevents failure. Not necessarily in the short term, but it prevents failure around the next version or multiple APIs by managing the life cycle of, or, or the life cycle of your entire API program as an organization. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Alistair Farkerson. I'm the CTO of SOA Software. You can reach me in the following way. We have a blog, we have white papers, and we have web pages that discuss the mobile application gateway solution. So with that, um, let me turn over to, to Hugh. I don't know, Hugh, if we uh, have had any questions from the audience, but please type them into the chat, and we may unmute the lines near the end as well. Um, but uh, over to you, Hugh. All right, I have a question here that talks about the, um, the orchestration specifically and what the difference is between a mobile application gateway and something like an, an, an ESB that organizations have. And this is a question actually that, that I run into a lot because you know, organizations have a lot of technology and I get the question, very often as to why do I need something else that performs orchestration when I have WebSphere or uh, you know, um, uh, any number of different kinds of technology stacks that can do orchestration as well. And the main reason here is I think all around making sure that your API and that your API program remains agile. If you think about uh, a, a typically a, a larger enterprise, they have a number of different kinds of technology stacks. And what I found in my practice is that every single one of those lines of business or departments have their own way of doing orchestration. And this comes about because of political reasons, because of technology reasons, but typically enterprises have not consolidated on a single enterprise service bus. So what you end up with is when you're trying to expose APIs, you end up having to piece together a number of different, albeit standards-based services, but you need to be able to piece together these things and expose an API. And typically the people who are exposing the APIs do not own the technology that exists to do orchestration on any or all of these different platforms. So 
quite selfishly, as a product manager that's exposing an API, I need some way, at least, of being able to do some level of orchestration. And we don't go out there and promise that we are the world's best uh, orchestration engine or the world's most complete orchestration engine. What we've done is we've taken a subset of orchestration that is about API enrichment, uh, about piecing together existing services and APIs on a fairly constrained set of transports and protocols, fairly constrained set of standards, and exposing an API. Essentially, we, 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 we almost expect the customer to have a service-oriented architecture behind the firewall. And we will take those services and APIs and piece them together to expose a new API. And the orchestration we typically do is exactly that. We don't have adapters into SAP and into mainframes and things like that. It's not our job to expose a database from raw queries and, and expose an API. Typically, where we are is a, an ESB of ESBs. We're there to take a set of services and APIs and help you abstract yourself in exposing the public API or the partner API that you're trying to do. So, we don't necessarily deal with state or transactionality or things like that. Those are within those backend systems and their own orchestration engines. We layer on a level of API orchestration that focuses on enrichment and certainly multiple API calls, but definitely within a set of standard interfaces. So we have another question here. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Where does your mobile gateway sit in the enterprise space? So our, our mobile gateway essentially, I, I think this is almost an extension of the question I, I, I just answered. But essentially our mobile gateway um, sits within or, or typically sits within the team that is exposing an API. Because what happens is we're going into organizations that are building APIs, and, and the person who is responsible for building those APIs is a product manager. And the APIs themselves are being funded by a particular or, or by a new line of business. Either that falls under mobile or it falls under e-commerce or it's somewhere within those kinds of parts of, of the enterprise. So our gateway is typically owned by those people, and their responsibility then is to interact with all of the other lines of business departments or systems and orchestrate and create this new API. So typically that mobile application gateway is near the edge of the enterprise, and it's responsible basically for supporting that API program Either the API program is a B2B program or it's a, um, a business-to-developer kind of program. And that's kind of where, uh, hopefully I'll answer that question appropriately, but we typically see that mobile application gateway sitting within that part of the enterprise. Technically speaking, it's either in the DMZ or just behind the DMZ. So our mobile application gateway can do all of the denial of service, all of the protection policies, all of the security policies, and typically we see it just behind the traditional firewall. Um, so it depends on which side your question was coming from, either physically or, or, or from a, a, a business perspective, uh, but hopefully I address both of those um, questions. Um, another question is, uh, how do we intersect or overlap with the mobile app management companies? Um, I think it's I, I, I think it's very complementary. I mean, essentially, our business here is how do we expose an API? We don't deal a great deal with, or we don't intersect a lot with the actual mobile app development process. So I see them as being adjacent, but not intersecting in any great or, or significant way. There is some overlap when it comes to lifecycle, of course, because we're responsible essentially for issuing credentials to the mobile app. So you would come into our product and you would register the mobile app and we would grant you the keys that are part and parcel of the mobile app development. The same way as you go to Twitter, you register your app, they give you a key and you're supposed to use that key when you build your app. That's the role we're in. So we intersect with 
um, or are adjacent to that mobile app development process, but we really are focusing on the APIs and the production of the API and then the support of the community around the API. So um, the intersections that we see are primarily around the exchange of, of security credentials, and then we also see a certain amount of intersection around lifecycle. So the mobile app gets built, but that mobile app needs to be certified before it can be published. So again, there is an intersection there uh, between the people who are providing the API and the people who are building the mobile app. Um, another question is, does the, the mobile gateway run on the JBoss server? Uh, yes, it can. The software version, of course, the, the appliance, the virtual appliance version cannot, but the other version can run on the JBoss server. It's not really needed. It's kind of a, an extra hassle, uh, so to speak. I mean, the thing does come uh, with its own JRE, and it's, it's all packaged up, and it, it just installs on the base operating system without the need of any application server. But you can, if, 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 if that's kind of the, the cookie cutter environment into which we can deploy and there's, there, there's no other options, we can deploy as a web, web application into a JBoss server. How do you integrate OAuth for, for mobile app authentication with enterprise identity providers such as Active Directory or ADFS? Um, the system essentially integrates with the traditional identity and access management systems through a plugin architecture. So we would layer on an authentication mechanism on top of ADFS or Active Directory, and then OAuth would follow on from that. So we could be an open ID provider, for example, or provide form-based authentication, or um, you know, a, a basic HTTP, basic auth, challenge response kind of authentication on top of AD and ADFS, which then would lead you into the OAuth three-legged dance where you would provide authorization for your application. You've got to remember that OAuth is, is basically an authorization framework, and it, the authentication itself is out of scope. But I think the answer to your question is, is that we have plugins or adapters for Active Directory, LDAP, SiteMinder, RSA, all of those things. <laughs> It essentially allows us to, to provide authentication and, in turn, OAuth on top of those uh, provider, providers. Sorry. Uh, let's see, there's a lot of questions here. I'm trying to get through all of these. Um, I answered that one. Let me just scroll up here. I think I've answered the more recent ones, and I've forgotten some of you that, that came earlier. Um, are analytics provided as part of the solution? Yes. Um, so the mobile application gateway has analytics that tells you who's using your APIs, what are your most popular apps uh, based on version, uh, you know, what parts of your APIs are being invoked, uh, you know, what, basically what are your most popular resources or operations within that API, um, where are your apps being distributed, so how are your APIs being leveraged globally, and those analytics are available within the system. We have pre-canned reports. Uh, you can also run <clears throat> analytics on top of that uh, product through our APIs that we provide and basically get an idea of how successful your API program is, how many APIs you have, who's using it, uh, what your different licenses uh, are consuming. So, you know, I, I sort of mentioned as we yeah. went through the presentation that we support licensing on top of an API. So you can come up with different tiers of service. And you can license out your API in different ways, maybe one dollar, five dollar, ten dollar uh, plans for for your API, and you can see who's using what and how much of each plan people are using, and you can bill people based on their consumption of the different plans. Um, do you provide any SDKs or JavaScript libraries for mobile app developers? No, we do not. Uh, we kind of draw the line at the API um, and and leave the the sort of app development aspects to the uh, app development companies. See, I know I left one out here. Um, analytics, enterprise space. Um, real life case studies, uh, yes. <laughs> there, there are a lot of them. I have somebody here asking me for, for real life case studies. I would say that, um, I mean, let me think of one in particular. So um, 
imagine a company, for example, that has uh, an ESB already. They are a financial institution, and they want to provide some way for people to determine their balance within their accounts. I have to be uh, careful about what I say, but um, there the, are the kind of two stages to this. There is the actual orchestration and mediation of the back-end services that already exist, and they might be on the mainframe. In other words, they might be using MQ with space-delimited kind of, of messaging. But on the front end, they want to expose an API for, for payments or for, for balance, balance inquiries. So they go ahead and they build an API, and they design the API from the top down. The dog's on the line. Please mute your line. So they're building an API and uh, they, they design the API with the customer in mind. So they figure out exactly what they want out of a payments API, what it should look like, and how it should be built and how it should be delivered. And they come up with a whole program of how they're going to launch this API and how it's going to be wonderful, the next generation around payments, etc. There's There's an issue, though, in that they've built this API and they've built the ideal API for payments. But... It's, it's disconnected from the internal systems. So they need to take this API that they've designed, they need to stub it out so people can start building mobile applications, but then they also have to stitch, back, stitch the whole back-end systems together to actually provide the data elements and the transactional functionality behind that API. So this particular customer is, is, is building this in, or has built this in two stages. In, in, in the first case, they use our gateway on-premise to do the orchestration. So the, the actual exposing of the technical API endpoint is being done on-premise. So the API call comes in. If it's a sandbox call, it goes to the, some JavaScript backend stubs that are hosted within the uh, mobile application gateway that return responses for pre-canned requests or pre-canned responses for, for specific requests. If the API call comes in and it's a production call, um, we're making multiple back-end calls over MQ to mainframe systems and other uh, services exposed on, on the ESB infrastructure to provide the actual back-end implementation for the, for the API front-end. That then just provides the raw API endpoint, and it's only confined to a single data center. What they then use our cloud infrastructure for is essentially proxying that API endpoint and delivering endpoints globally around the world and allowing us to provide OAuth on top of those endpoints as regionally as possible for the mobile applications. Secondarily, there's also the developer portal or the developer, um, well, the developer portal or website that they're exposing that API in. So people can come and read about the API, they can read the documentation, they can collaborate with other developers, they can see what that API is doing and how it's performing and get feedback for that particular API and then consume that API. So everything from the exposing of the API on premise, the proxying of that API in the cloud globally, and the hosting of the developer portal uh, to support the developer community around that API. Whew. Yeah. Um, let's see. Does it integrate with registry and repository to support RESTful SOA governance? Uh, yes, it does. Um, so that's a lot of what I referred to around lifecycle management. So lifecycle management, uh, uh, another term for lifecycle management is essentially governance. And you might internally within your enterprise or within your company have a registry repository that has APIs and services in it. And we integrate with those registry repositories. In fact, we provide them ourselves and you want to now also manage or control the life cycle of the APIs and understand how the APIs are using the services within that registry repository and manage the workflow and governance best practices around that. So that is bread and butter for the life cycle management capabilities that we provide uh, within the platform. Oh. Wow. That's very loud. <laughs> okay, other than the dog and cat fight we have on the line, I think I've answered all the questions that came through from the chat. Um, what are you doing? 
with that, I think I'll close the uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone.